I think we can start. Okay. So I'm uh, Peter Sarnak, a professor in the Maths department here, and it's my great pleasure to introduce the Minerva Lectures for this 2024. Uh, these lectures are sponsored by uh, or money that was given to us by the Fernholzers, Bob and Louise, and we are very grateful for that. It's allowed us to have these major lectures, which uh, started with Sarah years ago, and have continued with fantastic lecturers, including this year. So um, our speaker this year is Benson Fogg. He's got his PhD here in Princeton, so it's one of our own former students, uh, student of Thurston. Um, he's a professor at the University of Chicago. He's very famous for his research and his mentorship and his many PhDs. He's been recognized by many awards, and the most recent one was just a few weeks ago, uh, January 2024, the um, AMS Steele Prize for Mathematical Exposition for his book with Dan Margalit, a primer on the mapping class group, on mapping class groups, sorry. You should read the uh, citation. Uh, it ends with, it's, uh, this book is already a classic and it sets a standard for accessible, clear, and inviting writing. It stands as the very model of scholarship. And with that, let me introduce Benson Farb, who's a fantastic lecturer, and you will see him in action. And he's giving three lectures, same time, same place, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, I don't know what the global title of his lectures is, but I think the first one is called Rigidity of Moduli Space and Algeometric Constructions. Benson. Thanks for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, I should admit, so I gave a three talks here and at the Institute in 2019, and then there was like a fourth by a collaborator, Jesse Wolfson, and I was exhausted after those talks, and I thought, wow, I just told them literally everything I know, and a week later I got uh, an email, an invitation to give this talk, and I went into immediate panic mode, because you can't say no, but I had nothing to say. I mean, I just told them everything I knew. And, um, then, thankfully, the pandemic hit. Thankfully, in this narrow circumstance, the pandemic hit. And I want to thank you for the invitation because it spurred me in the last five years, we finally rescheduled it, um, to work my ass off to be able to say something. <laughs> um, and so I'm, I'm reporting on those and things I've been thinking about for a while. And let me just say, um, it's three talks. The first one is disjoint from the other two, maybe philosophically a way of looking at things connected, but I thought people can't um, pay attention for three talks, so I want to stay popular. So uh, if you hate this talk, still you should come to the next one, it's a totally different topic, more topological. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to explain this animation. So um, basically what I want to do, my main goal is to try to transmit to you guys a kind of guiding principle. Um, it's all in a paper I wrote called, uh, with the same title here, and it produces conjectures, and um, it's been producing them since I came up with this guiding principle a while ago, and uh, most of the time they're true, and when they're not true, there's some really uh, magical examples that people found, and I guess the motto would be, it's like a systematic search for miracles, and so, uh, yeah, let me say though where it started, a prologue was when I was an undergraduate at Cornell. I remember where I was sitting when I did this homework exercise. If you take n bigger than n bigger than two and you have a surjective homomorphism between the permutation group Sn on n letters and the permutation group on m letters, that exists if and only if nm equals four, three. And we had that as a homework exercise, and I remember doing it. And let me uh, just give the proof. Um, firstly, you don't have any, uh, and, and m is bigger than two because uh, S2 is Z mod two, and you have the sign representation. 
So you need n bigger than 2. But if n is at least 5, then the alternating group is simple. And it has order n factorial over 2. And if n is bigger than m, bigger than 2, then um, if it's a simple group, this is either trivial or injective. But SM has order less than n factorial over 2. So the alternating group dies. And so you factor through this homomorphism factors through Z mod 2, and so it can't be surjective. Okay. More interestingly, where in the world is this it's homomorphism coming from? From S4 to S3. And what it is, S4 acts on the conjugacy classes of a product of two cycles. It obviously acts transitively. So you get a surjection from S4 to S3. Now the amazing thing about this is for any permutation group, and it acts on any one of its conjugacy classes. And you'll never get a surjection. <laughs> you get a representation each time. It'll never be a surjection for one reason or another. So I always wondered, like, why 4, 3? What is the explanation? Um, there has to be deep inner meaning. In mathematics, I like to say a cigar is always just a cigar. Shouldn't say that. But um, <laughs> so when I got older, I eventually became a student of Thurston here. And I learned what the Bray group was. Um, it's the fundamental group of the space of unordered configurations, so just n unordered points in the plane, distinct points. You look at the space of distinct points, and what is the fundamental group of that space? The fundamental group, uh, you know, you have 80 people in this room, it's the points, and you say go, and it, a loop is we all move around, and then we sit back in chairs, our order has changed. I might sit in your chair, you might be up here. But, um, and so when you follow the path over time, it traces out a braid. So you can see that's a loop, and you get an induced permutation. Like one, two, three, here it goes to three, one, two. Oh, there we go. Whoops, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Little typo, this should be, the two goes to, oh yeah, that's okay, two goes to one, one goes to three, and three goes to two. And you can see you have a surjection from the Bray group to the symmetric group. The kernel is an infinite group. And the Bray group is a group, too. Another way to look at it is you can stack braids on top of each other. There's a whole story there. But I think um, pi 1 of configurations. So um, I then learned, I forgot where I learned it, but if you know what's called Thurston normal form, which we'll talk about later, kind of it's a normal form for braids. And even for mapping classes, uh, homeomorphisms, uh, here of the disk with punctures, you get this same theorem as before, 4, 3. So it's a kind of lift of the 4, 3 theorem that I started with. So I was older and wiser, but I still didn't know, uh, you know, why 4, 3? Why is it here? And you can write down this homomorphism. It sends like the first and the third thing to the third thing in the generator. I'm forgetting. I could work it out. Um, so why 4, 3? And um, I want to give an explanation. I just want to tell you how I sort of stumbled onto this sequence of questions this, via the story. So polynomials come into play. If you look at poly n, I'll let it be the space of monic degree n polynomials that are square free, no repeated roots. OK? So it's some algebraic variety. It's this discriminant, right? The condition for a polynomial to have repeated roots is a polynomial, delta n, in the coefficients. Like b squared minus 4c equals 0. That is the condition for a repeated root for a quadratic. And the basic theorem is that uh, the space of polynomials is isomorphic to the space of unordered configurations. And here's the proof. It's the fundamental theorem of algebra. Given a polynomial, I can, a square free, no repeated roots, I record the roots, and that's n tuple of unordered points in the plane. And given roots, I can form the polynomial with those as roots, figure out the coefficients, and I get an element of this algebraic variety. So it's really the fundamental theorem of algebra gives this. And so the fundamental group, the Bray group, is the fundamental group of the space of monic square free polynomials of degree n. And going back to my original story, I learned in high school, actually, about once you talk about polynomials, there's a miracle. 
resolving the cortic. It was, I think, an 18-year-old Ferrari uh, discovered this. There's an amazing map from square-free polynomials of degree 4 to square-free polynomials of degree 3. I'm going to give you the map. It's a holomorphic map. It's an algebraic map. But an exercise, if I give you an unordered four-tuple of points, you're supposed to come up with, in a canonical way, an unordered n-tuple of three points. If they're ordered, one, two, three, four, I just get rid of point number four, right? But if they're not, go ahead, what's the map? There's a ge geometric interpretation of this. I'm going to leave that as an exercise. But he did this in order to solve the cortex. You can solve a cortex this way, but I'm going to view this as a map between two moduli spaces of polynomials. And here's the map. You plug in the three, four roots, q1, q2, q3, q4, and you get a polynomial with these roots. So it's configuration. You can think about configuration of four points to three points. The magical thing about this formula is that if the qi are distinct, then the zj are distinct. OK? This doesn't work. You, you might ask, is there such a thing? Can we help solve the quintic by using the quartic, et cetera? Um, what else do I want to say about this? Yeah, that's the magical map. And if you look at the induced map on fundamental group, the fundamental group of the space of polynomials, you get a map from B4 to B3. That is the map. That's the one I told you about. It's a surjection. And then that induces, remember, B4 maps to B3. There's a commutative diagram. B4 maps to S4 maps to B3, maps to S3. And this explains, it's resolving the cortex is the real reason that S4 surjects to S3. And by the way, you can see, remember, you're acting transitively on the, the conjugacy class consisting of a pair of two cycles. You can see that in this formula. So to me, it's like a modular interpretation of that old thing. Uh-huh. Uh-oh. That, I would have to think about. I, I, th I think, oh yeah, here there's supposed to be a minus sign in the Q4. Yes, wow, good catch. Thank you. OK, that's why this exists. So that's my little story. And um, later, I conjectured, I thought a lot more about these spaces. And if you take these two algebraic varieties, um, and you, you'll ask, what are the holomorphic maps? Now, there's a quote unquote trivial ones I will tell you about. But I wanted to say if you take any holomorphic map, then NM is 4, 3, and you're the Ferrari map. In other words, this would be saying that, what, what did I just do? OK. Um, what it would be saying is that there are sort of no other miracles. The Ferrari map is the only way to associate one polynomial, a polynomial of lower degree um, to a polynomial of higher degree. And um, hope it would have been better if it was wrong, and then we would find something that the classic people didn't find. But um, oh, and I should say what trivial means. There's another variant. You can take the discriminant of the polynomial, and if you're square free, it's not zero. It's a complex number, non-zero. So you can take this map and then map C star into poly M, and you can do little variations on the Ferrari map composed with this. And it's actually a little bit of a list of things. And um, theorems by, uh, these are linear combinations. These three were my former PhD students. I think he got his PhD before I was born, but I'm still taking credit for his PhD. No, student of Arnold, um, that this conjecture is true. Yes, I conjectured it after his theorem. So <laughs> they're not independent. They're not independent. Um, yeah, busted, busted. OK, so it's sort of, so this is kind of one little story. and. Um, of a kind of, uh, oh, oh, to end the story, sorry. It is an open problem to classify the holomorphic maps from monic square free polynomials degree n to higher degree. We have no idea. There's some amazing ones. But first, let me say, there are many continuous ones. Given a polynomial of degree n, there's a really weird thing you can do to get a square free polynomial of degree n plus 1. You can take the roots of the first polynomial. And then 
I want to add one more point, and you need to do something canonical that's going to be well-defined. And so this guarantees that this last point, summation of the absolute values, is not equal to anything in there. That's why I did that. There's essentially one way to do this up to homotopy. And um, I, the, one of the conjectures is that there's no holomorphic way to do this. And you think, come on, how hard could this could be? This is almost holomorphic. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's not. So, OK. And there's one more amazing example that we'll talk about later from configurations of three points to configurations of n points. Remember, conf n is the same as poly n. This is unordered configurations. If you give me three complex numbers, a triple, unordered triple of distinct complex numbers, and you give me an integer k, you can do an amazing thing. You can, um, when you have a complex torus, it comes equipped with an involution, z goes to minus z. So you're skewering it and doing a 180 degree rotation, and it's a branch cover branched over four points. And the equation of the, the four points are sort of infinity and x1, x2, and x3, and the reverse process. If you give me three points, x1, x2, and x3, in, in the complex plane, I get four points because there's one at infinity, and that serves as like a base point. So I get a group. I get a torus with the base point telling me what zero is. And it's y squared. This is, of course, an elliptic curve. y squared equals x times x minus 1, x minus x2, x minus x3. And now that is a group. It's a good old fact, and um, one of the miracles of elliptic curves. And I can take the x coordinates of the k torsion points. Um, of the elementary, meaning like the primitive k-torsion points. And that's some set, m sub k, you can figure out what it is. And this is a holomorphic map. So there's all these interesting holomorphic maps. So how do you go about proving something like this? Like trying to classify all the maps. That's what we're going to talk about. But first, this whole story was an example of a guiding principle. And the overview of the guiding principle is um, I was a student of Thurston, but I keep moving in mathematics, and so I'm like a beginning algebraic geometer. Um, maybe been studying for 10 years. Um, yeah, I was so proud when I read some letter of recommendation um, for one of my students, and a famous algebraic geometer said, her advisor's transitioning to become an algebraic geometer. So I'm like, well, okay, at least I got that I'm transitioning become an algebraic job. Um, so given an algebraic geometric construction, there's all these amazing things. I'm saying this because for a newbie, oh my god, algebraic geometry is just full of all these incredible constructions, the 27 lines on a cubic surface, the nine flex points on a cubic, you know, 28 bitangents of a smooth cortex. But each of these things, you can realize, these, most of the classical constructions, it's equivalent to just giving a morphism between moduli spaces, or a section of a bundle, or a section of a bundle, which I'm not going to talk about today. So it's like just a reinterpretation that all algebraic geometers know. I'm going to call this a constructive map between moduli spaces, just meaning, and morphism and holomorphic I'm just going to use interchangeably today. Um, but it just means you're not doing something random, that the map is kind of points of these spaces are varieties, and you're defining it using a map of varieties. We'll give lots, a few examples. And the guiding principle is that these are rigid. And what I mean by rigid, there are many interpretations. One I'm going to concentrate today is holomorphic rigidity. If you have a family of moduli spaces parameterized by an integer, for example, monic square free degree m polynomials, right, is an example, or maybe m dimensional uh, abelian varieties, principally holarized abelian varieties. And you have two such things, and there's some amazing map psi between them, then of all such maps, there's only one, and it's equal. And sometimes maybe it's up to silly things like changing coordinates. Okay, So that's the idea, and there's variations on this. The most important thing, uh, again, it's not just maps between varieties. Sometimes it's sections of bundles, but it's, it's basically this. But you can ask this, are there any smooth maps 
that do it? Is there a smooth way to resolve the cortex? Or is there a smooth way to resolve a degree n polynomial that maybe uses transcendental functions, but easily to compute ones? And um, you can ask it for rational maps, and there's infinitesimal versions, like can you deform it? And it fits into kind of a framework. And um, let me first say, in proving such theorems, every theorem has like two pieces here when you do these kind of rigidity things. Um, th that's the other place this comes out of is um, in earlier incarnation as a mathematician, I worked on a lot of stuff related to Mostow rigidity and Margolis super rigidity. And um, those theorems, in many cases, can be reinterpreted as theorems that satisfy the guiding principle. Because those are about locally symmetric spaces, and some of those are varieties, and some of the maps have modular interpretations, et cetera. But anyway, if you have a map between two varieties and it's holomorphic, you want to understand first, what are all the homotopy classes? There's the constant map, and if you're constant and holomorphic, usually you're just, if you're homotopy, sorry, uh, the trivial homotopy class and you're holomorphic, you're constant, so that's silly. But other than that, you want to understand the homotopy classes. For example, pi one, uh, the map between pi ones is often a lot of information. It's definitely a homotopy invariant. And the second, suppose you can prove uh, your two maps, two such maps are homotopic and they're holomorphic, are they unique? And there's a general theme that holomorphic maps should be unique in their homotopy class. It's not true. Take a product of two complex manifolds and one of them is just homotopic, you can just perturb it, right? Think of one as the fiber. You just take the inclusion map and it just perturbs around. So it's false. Um, and yeah, so this ties in with, with a lot of stuff. Margola super rigidity, super rigidity. These kind of questions come up in the theory of Kobayashi hyperbolicity. And number theorists also like, like uh, uh, in fact, I use work of like faultings in Saito I'll talk about, but okay. So any questions? That's like the general philosophy. And my paper contains many, many, many examples for each, like a construction in algebraic geometry, producing a, a map, and then you study it. And I'm going to give you maybe one or two more. But I want to go a little in-depth into some of the ideas. OK. So first, any questions? OK, I want to say, how do you go about trying to understand a map between spaces, an arbitrary smooth map, or say, holomorphic map between these spaces of polynomials? Um, they're pretty complicated spaces. We know their cohomology groups rationally. That's, uh, it's the cohomology groups of these are the Bray groups. These are, uh, for people who know what it means, k pi one spaces for the Bray group. Um, and I just want to remind you, we still don't understand this when m is bigger than n. It's a totally open question. So hopefully someone here will solve some of these questions. But again, there's two parts. When you give me a map, then I get a homomorphism of Bray groups. And in this case, it actually determines the homotopy class of the map because these guys have contractible universal covers. So it's basic algebraic topology says, what are the homomorphism between Bray groups? So how do you study homomorphisms between Bray groups? So that's what I want to first talk about. How do you classify? Um, there's a whole program by Dan Margalit, uh, Lei Chen, Kevin Kordek, and others trying to list out when M is bigger than N. A lot of fascinating things can happen for experts like cabling and things like that, and you want to classify what can happen. But what I like about it is you can then apply it to say things about spaces of polynomials. And I want to go back to this example, and I want to tell you how to classify homomorphisms between braid groups. And let me just say, before I do this, to classify a homomorphism from one group to another. Um, well, let's do representation theory. So it's like GLN of the complex numbers. What do you do with, um, you look at phi of G, it's a matrix. And so um, hopefully it has a kind of Jordan canonical form, right? 
And the Jordan canonical form puts you into, makes you into these blocks, et cetera. And then you, you have to know the eigenvalues and, right? So without that, how can you do any rep theory? Not knowing Jordan canonical form. And what Thurston did is for braids and more generally, um, surface homeomorphisms, homotopic classes of surface homeomorphisms. He gave a kind of Thurston normal form, which is what it's called today. It breaks up. Uh, I'll show you what it does. But that's the first step. And then you start to say, gee, what are the algebraic reasons here? Like an abelian group here goes to an abelian group here. And remember, uh, commuting matrices are simultaneously diagonalizable. So you start like pinning down where the different matrices can go, right? Okay, so let's look at this amazing example. It, give me three points. I'm supposed to give you some huge number, which I'll tell you. It's the primitive K torsion point. So again, you have an equation. It determines by, Weier, by Weierstrass, it determines a torus, C mod lambda, which is a group under addition, mod lambda. The two torsion points are just zero, a half, a half plus i, just like for the square torus, right? Two torsion just means you add it to itself and it's in the lattice. Then there's three torsion points, there's nine of them. But only eight are primitive because zero, right? That's what I mean by elementary. So any questions as to what I mean? So you get these holomorphic maps. So if you want to say that any holomorphic map from here to here is unique, for example, you need to understand the original map. I mean, that's how Margolis superjudy, all these things, you, it's about representations of a group, linear representations. You have an example, and then you have something arbitrary, and you want to prove they're equal. So you start listing all the properties of your mir miraculous thing, and then you try to prove one at a time until you have so many that they're equal. Somebody said to me once, Benson, how do you like that there's no examples? You're just proving there's no examples. And what I say is, no, no, we're encountering the example when you do these rigidity things. You know, if I list every atom in the body of Peter Sarnak, that determines him. But that's a pretty boring thing. And you say, what are the three properties of Sarnak that determine Sarnak? We should definitely do that over beer. But that's what, to me, rigidity is. You, you look deep into the soul of the example. And there's so many of these. That's what this kind of thing is about, this rigidity. Um, and, and when it's not true, you've discovered another kind of person who's just as good as Sarnak or not, but maybe better. Probably, yeah. So in this case, what is the induced map on fundamental group? And here's the picture. Um, the animations, and there's math behind the animations, so they're not trivial, are by my student Peter Huxford. So this is psi three. So you're taking, these are the roots of a polynomial of degree three. Then you take y squared equals that polynomial. I mean, the roots are moving around. This is a loop in the space of configurations. You write down the equation y squared equals this degree three polynomial. It has torsion points via this kind of uh, Weierstrass magic. It's, and it's like this equation, the points of this are a group. And you write down the x coordinates, and you're going to get four of them. Okay. Um, why? Because three torsion points, there's nine of them. So I'm doing three. This, is, this three is three torsion. There's nine three torsion points, but eight are elementary or primitive, because zero doesn't count, so you throw away zero. There's eight, but then they're doubled up because of this y squared, and so you get four, okay? And as this moves, I'm solving the equation, or Peter's solving the equation. So any questions? So this is exhibiting a homomorphism. This is one of the generators of the braid group. The other alternates the next two points. This is a generator, and it goes to this loop of configurations. That's what we're trying to come to grips with, what this looks like, and then show any other homomorphism has this property. So here's what Thurston does. You want to group things together, like block matrices, and here we can all see, it's pretty visible, yes? That those three are sticking together, are, okay. Oh, so that's the Thurston, whoop. That's the Thurston normal form. So any questions? This is, it's leaving invariant for, for experts. There's a homeomorphism of the plane, minus four points. 
the four punctured plane, where you take your fingers and like move the points around, that's where you're getting the braid from. It's leaving an invariant, this leaves invariant a unique simple closed curve, not homotopic to one of the punctures. That's it. If you draw any other curve, here's an exercise. Draw, one exercise is to be able to basic use of the clicker, anyway, which I'm failing. Um, any other embedded loop in the four punctured plane, by the way, that's moving a little, in the four punctured plane will not be invariant. I know this is visually obvious here, but Thurston produces such a thing for you, for all pictures, okay? Let me do another one. This is taking the four torsion points. So there's the elementary, primitive four torsion points. And there's 12 of them, so divide by two, the x-coordinates, there's six of them. It produces this magical map between configuration spaces. There's the map, and there's the Thurston normal form. So any questions? This is how you start trying to understand this problem, which is only solved going from bigger to smaller. In this case, Huxford and Schilvert, his, his collaborator, are currently working on it, but it's tough. What about that, that sort of solitary point? Oh yeah, what I said is it's the only simple closed curve that's not homotopic to, into one of the circles. So you can, you can put one around any individual one. This you can. Okay, and how, now you're taking the five torsion points, but I wanna point something out. It's five torsion points, it's going to, there's 24 of them, and you get this. So this becomes harder to, there's the first to normal form, there's two curves. Peter figured all this out, Peter Huxford. There it is, but I'm taking credit for my students' work. No, I had nothing to do with this. But, and, um, okay, and, one fascinating thing, uh, it's probably well known, it's easy arithmetic, is that the number of six torsion points and the number of elementary five torsion points, there's the same number, there's 24. So there are two maps, psi six going from here to here, and psi five, which we just saw. There's two of them, and they should be the only holomorphic ones. And notice the Thurston normal form. What you're doing, on the, you get two different homomorphisms from the Bray group on three strands to the Bray group on 12 strands. And this generator, this braid, in this case goes to this thing. And let me just go back to the other. See, this one had two loops that are invariant. This one has three. Anyway, I think that's enough of these pictures, even though they're really fun, too. Okay, questions? Okay, let me give one more example of a kind of a beautiful map of moduli spaces. And what you do, we talked about the topological. How do you prove the topological part of these? And I want to talk about the holomorphic part. And so I want to talk about the period mapping. So if you start, there's a very classical thing going back to Riemann. You start with a smooth genus G uh, Riemann surface. I said curve, algebraic curve. But, and, um, you look at the holomorphic one forms, that's, that's a g-dimensional complex space, and you look at the dual of the holomorphic one forms. There's a canonical embedding of the first homology. If you give me a one cycle on a genus G surface, I can integrate against it. And that gives you a linear functional in the space of holomorphic one forms. This is all canonical. And so one thing embeds into another, and you get a torus, there it is. I shouldn't have called it z to the 2g. It's some kind of lattice. It has a shape. But as an abelian group, it's z to the 2g. You get a torus. It's called a principally polarized abelian variety. Don't worry if you don't know what that means. There's a little extra structure coming from the intersection form on the surface. But let me call that j of x. So we, this is a classical thing. To every genus g surface, which is a very nonlinear thing, you've attached a g complex dimensional torus, which is a very linear thing. And that's very powerful. And it produces this map. These days we would say, well, there's these two moduli spaces of these objects, g-dimensional abelian varieties, so complex tori with this extra structure, and genus G curves. And this is just producing a holomorphic map between them. That's this miracle. It's, it's a holomorphic map. It's not constant. People have been studying this map for 150 years. And what I was wondering about is, is there another map 
can I get a smaller dimensional torus? Because the bad thing about this is the torus is so high dimensional. Is there a more clever thing to do than Riemann? I, I mean, I, let's face it, we already knew the answer before. But anyway, but I, um, and so the answer is almost actually. It's not so crazy to think that you can get a lower dimensional. There's something called the prim map, which was popularized, I believe, defined by Mumford, but Prim really studied it in about 1900. And you take genus G Riemann surface, and there's a cover of the moduli space. And what it is, you take a Riemann surface together with a little piece of data, just an Z mod 2, an F2 um, class in H upper 1, OK? This little Z mod 2 invariant, these pairs, with that extra data, I can produce from a genus G Riemann surface and this little extra piece of data, um, Prim and Mumford produce a smaller tori, a G minus one dimensional torus. It's very beautiful because this Z mod two, it's like a homomorphism of the fundamental group of Z mod two. So this little piece of data is like a, a, a two-sheeted cover, X twiddle theta. It's a two-sheeted cover of the surface. And holomorphic forms pull back to holomorphic forms, and you get an embedding of one, uh, uh, one of these abelian, these Jacobians into another. And you can take their quotient, and you work out the dimension, and it's g minus 1 dimensional. So if you give me a little more, I can do it. So maybe people miss something. But also, it's like a fundamental map I want to study. And the theorem is that for g at least 3, I don't know if you need three. Um, then you definitely need at least two. As long as H is smaller than or equal to G, either and you have any non-constant holomorphic map, H equals G and F is equal dead on as a map, like pointwise equal to this classical map. So this classical thing that Riemann found is a indeed like rigid, it's unique, it's a miracle. If you let G get H get bigger where you take covers of mg, it's false. But it would be really interesting to classify. I'll talk about that. And there's been a bunch of work since I came out with this. There's a bunch of algebraic geometers who did an infinitesimal version. Like, you can't deform the map a little. This is global rigidity. But their proof is very different. And they did like a spin Torelli. By the way, yes, that is an algebraic geometer named Torelli, Sarah Torelli. Um, Servan, uh, my student, uh, Carlos Servan um, proved a similar thing, that the prim map is the smallest abelian variety you can attach to the prim thing. It's much harder than my theorem. And um, once you allow me to do covers, this is just a comment for experts, you can take the period mapping and use hectic correspondences, and you get all these new abelian, but that should sort of be everything, but that's going to be a lot harder. But that, that's like, why I would conjecture that. I think that's safe to conjecture. Um, although, this comes in the fact that this is actually, the fundamental group is an arithmetic group. And once you get into the world of arithmetic groups, there's all these really beautiful symmetries that pop up that you don't see in the outside world. So let me just give a proof outline, OK, of how I go about proving such a thing. So the input is I have this classical map J going from MG, whoops, to AH. Sorry, that should be an H. H less. And I have an arbitrary map. And I want to prove if F is not constant, it's equal. Okay. And so, again, the first thing is to classify maps from the fundamental group of this space to the fundamental group of this space. Don't, this orb is just so somebody doesn't ask me. Uh, uh, these things are not exactly, there's a torsion problem, so you have to do it in the category of orbifolds. That's not important for this talk. But the fundamental group of this orbifold is the mapping class group. It's pi naught of diff plus of a genus G surface. And this is the integral symplectic group, SP2GZ. And you can use this Thurston normal form and work of quark mass the congruent subgroup property and some other things to classify all homomorphisms from here to here that are not constant, that are not the trivial rep. And when H is less than or equal to G, you can prove it's the standard one. 
So that's the entire topological part of the proof. And one thing that's appealing to me about this general principle and the, trying to solve the conjectures that it produces is in geometric group theory, which is where I started, and in rigidity as well, you're studying homomorphisms between groups and using their geometry and navigating around, just like here, homomorphisms between braid groups. You had to understand braids and this Thurston normal form. It's its own whole world, and people have been studying those things because they're just beautiful as group theory problems. But here it's like, wait, we can apply this. Like, here's all this machinery that people have been building up, and it can apply over here. And so this is one of the things, like what are the linear representations of the mapping cross curve? So that's what you would need to know if, what are the representations of a genus G into a genus G plus a billion, or 100 G? So that's the topological part, and then you can pretty quickly reduce it to G equals H, and F is homotopic to G. You're using something deep. The two deep things you're using are that these moduli spaces have contractible universal covers. I think that's one of them's due to like Riemann, and this is due probably to Riemann. <laughs> I'm not sure. Okay. But so you need to disprove if you're homotopic and you have two holomorphic maps, then you are equal. But here's the problem in the target in AG, there are homotopic maps. They're holomorphic maps of some, with some domains that are not equal to each other because you have a product of a curve cross a curve. And I can just, like I said, perturb the curve to here. That's homotopic and it's holomorphic. But I can take C cross X1 versus that's kind of homotopic to C cross X2 for any X1 and X2 in the base C, in the other copy of C. So you definitely have that, and people have studied this, like um, this definitely occurs in work of Baltings and Saito and people who study these kind of things. But um, yeah, so how do you do this? And I'm gonna, there's other ways to do what I'm gonna do, but I wanted to show you one method. There's something I've been wanting to do for a really long time and I found, was able to use it. So um, here's what you do. This space AG, it is a bounded, you take a bounded symmetric domain. So there's a bounded domain in some huge complex dimensional space and you're modding out by a group of biholomorphic automorphisms and you get this. This is all classical stuff, but not actually uh, so easy but it's true. And Burrell and Narasimhan in the 60s proved that for these bounded symmetric domains, these, these are sort of some of the most beautiful complex manifolds that there are, where you take their quotients by a kind of group acting properly discontinuously by, by holomorphic automorphisms. If you have maps of, say, I know our space is not compact, but of, say, compact complex manifold, two maps, and they're homotopic, and they're both holomorphic, the maps will be equal. You just have to show they're equal at one point. So I have two maps into a space from the same, two different maps, and I just want to show they're equal at one point, then they'll be equal at all points. It's a kind of magical property. And hidden behind here is that this moduli space, whoop, is that this moduli space, AG, has a kind of arithmetic structure, so that's hidden behind this, their proof. And this is used, this is like a key ingredient, by the way, in um, Schmid's famous work on Hodge theory and all this stuff, okay? So when I saw this, I'm like, oh my God, this has just wiped out the problem. I just have to prove these two things are equal at a point. How hard could that be? And then I realized I don't know any theorems to prove two maps um, take the same value at a point. I mean, I, <laughs> okay. See, I, I should teach calculus more. That, then I would know theorems. But it's not, unfortunately, like not on the interval. Um, so here's an idea. And what's great is this was a failed idea from another project. And I'd been waiting for years and years to use it. So those failed ideas um, can be useful. If I, have, I, I will definitely claim I may not be the strongest mathematician, but I think I have more failed ideas than any other mathematician. 
<laughs> so, um, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to restrict. I have a map F from MG. I just want to remind you. We have our famous period mapping, J, from MG to AG. And now I'm given an arbitrary map, polymorphic map from MG to AG. And F is homotopic to J. And I want that F equals J, point-wise. So, well, they're homotopic. Well, let me just, uh, these things are algebraic varieties living in a big projective space. I can just keep slicing it with hyperplanes until I get a curve, like a one-dimensional complex surf, like a genus, a trillion things sitting in one of these spaces. Now it's easier, because at least it's one curve. And I have two homotopic maps. I just restrict the homotopy. So this is my picture of a crazy homotopy of two maps of a surface into a space. So any questions? And I just want to prove, if it's really equal at every point, then um, f, f of x should equal j of x for some x on this curve. So I'm like, OK, good. At least I can think about this. But how do you show that two maps are equal? So here's what I do. I first use a fact. I, I first take each of these lines and straighten it to a geodesic in the target, to a geodesic homotopy. And I'm using the non-positive curvature of this moduli space. I used to wonder, why are all these people trying to get these metrics? Yao does it all the time, these metrics on moduli spaces. And it's because you can do stuff with them. <laughs> So the moduli space of abelian varieties, principally polarized abelian varieties, it has a metric on it. So its points are abelian varieties, and it has a metric. And in fact, it's this beautiful metric coming from the Lie group. It's a symmetric space, and it has non-positive curvature. Um, although I do think that there's many of the moduli spaces people don't actually use. God is giving you a metric, and everybody sort of claps, and they don't use the metric. As far as I know, they don't use it so much, but anyway. I'm going to use it. Because you're not positive curv curvature, you can kind of pull these tight. And now there's this idea that I was waiting to use. Um, and this is inspired by um, Aramayona, Suto, and um, sorry, I'm forgetting the third name. But um, call it the Verdinger squeeze. Verdinger's inequality relates the Ramanian geometry to um, symplectic geometry of a two-form. And this is a version of Verdinger's inequality. For experts who know Verdinger, it's an inequality with equality if and only if your submanifold is a complex manifold. So there's some inequality that if you have a map of a surface into AG, you can take, there's this amazing two-form on AG, coming from the fact that it's an algebraic variety. Okay, It's the Kähler form. You can pull it back, a two-form. And you get a two-form at a point. On the other hand, there's an energy of a map, which is like the square norm of its derivative. And here's another two-form, a two-form of a surface, your domain surface. And you always get this inequality. Okay, It's like a point-wise thing. It's soft. But the cool thing is um, a map F is holomorphic. F here, little f here is any of the intermediate homotopies. A map F is holomorphic at x if and only if this is an equality at every single point. To me, this was amazing because you are producing a holomorphic map without using like PDE. And I always wanted to do that. But there's never a context where you can do it. But I have a holomorphic map at time zero. I took a holomorphic map and restricted it to a curve. And my mystery map, and I took the Jacobian, you know, this, this period mapping, and I restricted it. That's holomorphic, that's holomorphic. These are geodesics, and you look at convexity of Jacobi fields and use non-positive curvature to show that the energy functional is like convex, and you have a convexity with an equality here and here, and you're convex, and so it must be equality everywhere. And so that means this homotopy is through holomorphic maps. I think this argument should be useful in other contexts. It takes a homotopy and produces a um, homotopy through holomorphic maps. And um, you can believe me that we're in an algebraic setting, so I can bump up 
holomorphic to algebraic with Child's theorem. Even though you're not compact, you have to com do fit compactify. So I can make this algebraic. So we're in this space AG of abelian varieties. And I have some kind of a surface. Maybe it's not compact. And, but that gives me a family of abelian varieties, right? This is supposed to be a G torus, right? As you move, it's a curve. It's a family. It's just a one complex dimensional family of abelian varieties. People study that all the time. <laughs> and so um, I knew people study that. So I started to look up. Oh, this is a deformation of a family. And there's a whole story here that I don't have time to say. But um, I actually, you can use the deformation theory of abelian varieties. Um, I wanted to know, when is it? So I, I have this deformation of a family, right? This is a homotopy. I want to prove these two things are equal. So if I could find a family of varieties that come from curves, so it's coming from MG. It's not just any family, right? This, this surface was coming from MG. But if I can find a family of curves who, when you pointwise, it gives you a family of abelian varieties, if I can find one that you can't deform at all, you can't deform, then you're equal. There's no deformation. They're just equal and sitting there for the whole time. So I looked up, like I tried to find papers. And Saito has a paper with a bunch of criteria. And then um, it's another story, but using just uh, a lot of geometry and topology of these spaces, um, I found a curve C in MG that when you map it to AG, it doesn't have any deformations. So it's, and therefore, this is constant. And therefore, this side equals this side. So F at any point here is equal to J at any point here. I proved your two maps are equal at a point, and I'm done. No, because this was a global. I already reduced it to any an arbitrary thing. Right. There's local rigidity things that, um, that give finiteness theorems. And these global things are kind of a, a step harder. Um, OK, I want to end. I'm going to end a little early. But there's something that came up that's sort of like the philosophy of stuff I've been thinking about for the last 10 years, but definitely in terms of this. Um, Oh, I had Hagoroma the whole time, right? Um, definitely in terms of something that's really um, amazing to me that relates to this story that I'd love to post to the audience. And it's based on my own stuff, but also these joint projects with Jesse Wilson and Mark Kissin. I, maybe I might call it an exceptional homomorphisms or have modular interpretations. That would be my conjecture. But let me just tell you what I'm talking about very briefly. And you'll see um, it happens all the time for any kind of moduli space, say of degree d curves, cubic surfaces, genus g Riemann surfaces. You can, it has a covering space where you can take pairs, x comma d, where X is one of the things in your moduli space, and D is some geometric object. It could be a point in your variety. It could be a tangent, a bitangent, a line contained in your variety. It's called an incidence variety. It's basic and enumerative algebraic geometry. And we saw, here's another example. You take the set of polynomials, comma, a complex number, a co po polynomial, comma, a root. Right? You forget about the root. And that gives you a polynomial. And it's not a regular cover, but it's got a monodromy that's the symmetric group. Right? So solving a polynomial is just studying like an inverse to this. I know you don't have an, it's the theory of algebraic function. But it happens all the time. You take the smooth cubic surfaces in CP3, and then you take cubic surfaces equipped with a line. There's 27. It's a famous story. You don't get all the. The monodromy isn't all the permutations S27. You get, amazingly, the vial group of type E6. And over here, another thing with bitangents, and there's another one with this is abelian variety is equipped with p-torsion points. And you get these finite groups each time. These finite simple groups are occurring as monodromy groups. And uh, yeah, whoops, note to self, go to board. 
What I want to say, in all of these cases, these amazing maps between finite groups, I'm going to give two or three examples. You take, we had a map from um, poly 4 to poly 4, okay, S4, poly 3. This is this cover, things can, can, with roots, and this is an S3 cover, and this is Ferrari's map. So when I say the Ferrari map explains the surjection from S4 to S3, it's this commutative diagram. Another famous one. Hello. OK, I better go over here. Another famous one is Felix Klein discovered. If you take the upper half plane, mod SL2Z, and then you take the level five subgroup, which is just the matrices congruent to the identity mod five. So here you get the group PSL2 F5. This is birationally isomorphic. Two, you can take CP1, or C hat, if you wish, and the icosahedral group acts on it by symmetries of the icosahedron. There's a map studied by Klein that in the same way, it shows these two groups, PSL2F5, it's an exceptional isomorphism of finite simple groups, is isomorphic to A5. One of my favorites is S6 is isomorphic to the symplectic group F2. And what I love about it is S6 comes from degree six polynomials. So let me say something that's birationally true. Six points in the plane in CP1, ordered, and then six points unordered. Okay, that's a moduli space that's sort of representing S6, what it's doing. And what you can do, I'm running out of time, it goes through the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. But here's a cool thing you can do with six unordered points. You can get a genus two surface. If I take the two, if you give me six unordered points, I have a complex structure on CP1, I can take the branch cover. Two sheet of branch cover branched at the points. The reverse process is skewing this and doing 160 degrees, and you'll have six points. So if you give me six points, I can create a genus two curve from that. And then I can take its um, period mapping. It produces an element of A2. And now if I order the points, if I order the six points, I can take a slit between them and I know which point is number one, two, three. That's the same thing as choosing a mod two homology basis. And so, the group S6 is actually, this gives a map, a beautiful map that has this beautiful geometric interpretation. And, and I should say that every genus two curve is of this form, but it gives a reason why S6 and SP4, F2 are isomorphic groups. And I will give, end with two open, my question to the audience is, is it true that these amazing groups that come up these finite simple groups, or almost simple. Sn is a finite, let's count it as a finite simple group. Um, does everyone come, have like a modular interpretation, firstly? Is it always a moduli space and a moduli space equipped with some data? And secondly, for the ones where we know that's true, like Wv6, there's an, in, this is a finite simple group of order, it's like the vial group of type E6. That is actually isomorphic to PSP4F3, I believe. Uh-oh. And there's a modular interpretation of that one as well. It's abelian surfaces with three torsion. But why? There should, there's moduli spaces att attached sort of with each of these. There should be a map from one to another. Jesse Wilson and Ron Danagi, he's a professional unlike Jesse and I, but we couldn't come at this kind of thing, and we couldn't find the map. Felix Klein realized there's some, so do that, and then there's like PGL, 
to F9 is isomorphic. It goes on, but it's great. There should be like mobs or interpretations. So just to summarize the talk, which for the record, I did not go over. Um, it was a minute late. There's a guiding principle that algebraic geometry constructions are rigid. We have these examples, and it's still open in these cases. I lost my clicker completely. It's open in the cases m bigger than n and h bigger than g. It has all these different kind of pieces. And there are many more examples um, that I didn't talk about, like enumerative geometry questions and things like that, but of this ilk, and they all relate. And a player in all of these are these locally symmetric spaces that come up all the time, and that's directly connected to Mostow Margolis level rigidity, which can be like reinterpreted in this way. So it's like a kind of whole story there. But um, it's in that paper, which is in the Churn 110th birthday conference, but it's on my um, webpage. So with that, I'll end. Thanks, Benson, for a wonderful lecture and very stimulating, entertaining as always. Are there any questions? Yes. Right there. Uh, actually, since there are people on uh, Zoom. Okay, can I, I go back and explain this? Or go back further? Thank you, sorry. Um, can you just explain how you're getting the vowel groups of the exceptional groups coming up in these covers? How I'm getting the exceptional groups? Oh yeah. Yeah, so the WE6 and like the WE7. Sure, let me just pick one. Well, this one we saw. Um, it's a monodromy. If you want to think of it as you take the Galois cover, the smallest normal cover, that's the group, the deck group acting. Um, and that this has an interpretation of just when you have one root, it doesn't have a name. You can name all the roots, root number one, two, three to n, but then the symmetric group acts and change the name. That's where Sn is happening. Um, where the WV6 is coming, you have smooth cubic surfaces and smooth cubic surfaces equipped with a line. This is, there's a whole story here. It goes back to Jordan, Camille Jordan. And um, what you're doing is you're forgetting the first piece of, the second piece of data. So then the inverse image of this map, the inverse image of x, it's the set of lines on x. And it turns out it's a 27-sheeted covering. That's how, you could, that's how you prove there are 27 lines on a smooth cubic surface. You prove it's a covering space over a connected base. And then you need to show at one point, and you do the Fermat. It's beautiful. And so if I stay here and I take a loop in the moduli space, what is the monodromy? In a covering space, what is monodromy? You take a point. It literally is good old fashioned topology. You take a point in the base, and then you have a covering space, and it has the fiber, and there's the pancake picture. And then you take a loop downstairs, and then you pick, and you pick a point, and it induces a permutation. So what I do is I'm, I'm taking a loop of smooth cubic surfaces. I'm like changing the coefficients. I have a computer thing that Sean Howe made that does this. And the lines, they're moving around. And they come back to where they start as a set, but it's permuted. So you might say this is uh, just to be S27, because it's a 27-sheeted covering. But notice, if they started out disjoint, they're not going to become intersecting because it's a homeomorphism. And you draw the graph, which I have somewhere in my computer, called the Shafley graph. Look it up, SC8, it's awesome. It's got 27 vertices, and it's the intersection pattern of all the lines. It's an amazing graph. And it, Camille Jordan realized that um, you don't get all of S27. You get the vowel group of type E6. And that has all these beautiful repercussions for like counting points over finite fields on a smooth cubic surface. It's great. Yeah, there's, there's great stories there. So ask, in fact, lots of people here are experts in that. And similarly here, each one of these has an amazing story. And that was one of the things that was so compelling to me, getting into this area. And, and there's a hidden thing here. There's 
arithmetic groups, Hodge theory and period mappings in Hodge theory, and these are really quotients of arithmetic groups by congruent subgroups. So that's a whole other dimension. Yeah, I just scared everybody else. They're like, oh my god, it's going to be like a 10 minute answer. I mean, you did use the congruent subgroup property at some yeah. point. Yeah. Why do you need that? Um, Oh, because you don't get enough information about representation of the mapping class group, and then you have to kind of up the conjugacy and use CSP. You need to know what the finite. You need to know all the finite quotients too, and yeah. Uh, just a question on something you wrote down on the board over there with the Ferrari map between the yeah. poly four and poly three tilde. Uh, it's unclear to me how you take a pointed four. Or, for degree four polynomial and actually pick out a root of the result yes. in degree three. So yes, good. You caught a small lie. There's really a, what the Ferrari map really is, if you take the smallest normal covering contained, this is not a regular cover. I picked out one root. You're totally correct. What's really here is poly four twiddle twiddle, which is the set of all the orderings of all the roots. So that's why, that's, a, that's like a S4 cover, it's a 24 sheeted cover, because it's all the orderings of, all the, of a four tuple of roots. So the Ferrari map is really defined up here. Why? Because we picked a specific ordering, X, Q1, Q2, Q3, but it's equivariant, and so it descends all the way down here, so you sort of could have done this anywhere, but good catch. Okay, thank you. Oh yeah, do you get do you get like the monster group? Yeah. What? Yeah. Okay, um, let me just make clear that I'm not a rigid guy. Okay. <laughs> I think you said somewhere that you went in and that I'm rigid, but I don't believe I'm rigid. All right. Uh, let's thank Benson for a wonderful talk and we'll continue. We'll meet you at 4.30, same place, Wednesday.